Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next episode. My name is Kelly Deutsch, and today I'm joined by three artists, and I'm excited to be able to um, explore a few of their stories and what inspires them to create art. Uh, we have um, Kate Marin, who is a sculptor in the middle. We have Kelly Cruz, who is a painter and a musician, among many things. And Laura Wilde, who is an opera singer, a soprano. And each of them bring uh, beautiful things to their art. And one thing that overlaps all of their inspiration is this sense of longing, which, um, as you may know, I've also written about. So it's fun to be able to connect with others who have, share similar inspiration in their art. But before we get too far into any of those overlapping themes, the first question that I'd like to ask you three is, why do you use the medium that you do? Whether it's voice or clay or canvas or anything else, what is it that you're trying to express through it? And Kate, why don't we start with you? I love the three-dimensionality of it. I love the fact that to understand what's wrong with this part that I'm struggling with, it so helps me to go and see the backside. Like if I can look at it from a different angle, I'm going to figure out the problem on this. Like you have to go to the behind it, up, under, whatever, like all around. And it's going to help me problem solve. It's going to help me find, I don't know, just different, even different parts of the story. Like if you look at a sculpture from one angle, you feel one narrative. But if you go and stand on the right, all of a sudden the story can change, you know? And so I just really enjoy like the dimensionality of it. Um, even in that spiritual sense of it too and just how it can be like a pretty grand size and always in art it's like you really understand it the farther back you can get from it you know so like it's so tempting to stay messy with your hands in the clay and just like keep keep working keep working but like sculpture almost demands me more than even with painting to just stay step back but at the same time, it like satiates that need for me to just be in the art. Like we're painting or drawing, there's always a utensil between me and that piece of paper. But the sculpture, it's my fingerprints. It's like, it's me in there, you know? So it's kind of that push and pull between what I know I have to do, which is get distance. But then it invites me back in and it makes me touch it to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, that's <laughs> lovely. It makes me think of just the transcendent and the imminent, you know, I mean, of, of the divine, how there's that, there needs to be that intersection of both and maybe even a tension between the both that there is some separation, um, but there's something really beautiful about how close and intimate it is as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, beautiful. Yeah, how about you, Kelly? My primary medium is ink, actually. Mm. It's acrylic ink, so um, it's it's much more fluid than paint. Um, it's just like if you think, uh, basically, I'm putting ink on the canvas, and then I've got a spray bottle in one hand and a brush in the other, and I'm pushing it with water and manipulating it and moving it where I want it. And um, I think that that's so that's my native. I've, I've described it many times. It's like my native language. I've painted and worked in so many different mediums in visual art from drawing and painting and loved a lot, but something about ink did feel, it felt like coming home, but mm -hmm. I'd never been there before. Um, when I first started using it in like 2015, I think is when I started experimenting with acrylic ink and I just didn't want to use anything else. It's like every time I went to another medium, it, I, I just, I, it was like I was trying to make it do what the ink did. So then mm -hmm. eventually quit trying the other stuff for, my colors because I knew the ink would do what I wanted it to. But um, surface material is something I use in my work a lot to try to, because my work is non-representational. Um, so I'm not trying to accurately represent anything. I'm trying to convey the unseen visual image that lies behind an idea or a passage of scripture or whatever it is. And so sometimes the surface material reflects that. So if I'm thinking about fragility, human fragility or the incarnation, I might use something purposely fragile as a surface material, like vellum or paper. Um, or I may incorporate ash or charcoal, wood, wood ash into a painting because I'm thinking about uh, what happens 
how is it really possible that the body can be resurrected from carbon? <laughs> like, so that like the material, it, it, from painting to painting, it changes. Um, it, not every painting certainly has each material charged with that much meaning, but I think um, in contemporary art, that is something that we talk about and we think about a lot more maybe um, is the significance of the materials. Why, why was that material chosen over another? And um, so for me, it's, it's from painting to painting, but ink is just like my native tongue. Mm. Um, but I, I, I just listened to you talk about sculpting and I'm like, oh, I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I would never be able to do it like you do it, but you don't know the like, the, um, yeah, there is this like beauty. You're laughing you because know, you're going to try. You know, yeah. like, <laughs> I'll try to figure out anything. That's just the way I've always been my whole life. And my parents just humored me. And, but there is, I have settled like on certain things, but I just, I had to answer that honestly. Like what medium do I not want to try? <laughs> um, yeah, so I actually pursued trumpet um, first. So I went to college as a trumpet performance major. And for me, it was, it was just clear I was going to be a musician and I, took voice lessons for the first time my, right before my senior year of high school and was like, oh, there might be something here. I actually discovered my classical voice making fun of opera in a choir concert. Uh huh. <laughs> I had a solo and, I, and, and they said, you know, do it in this classical style, make fun of an opera singer, and this voice came out. And so it sort of was there, but it was raw. And I, I had opinions about singers, instrumentalists do, you know them. Um, <laughs> But I think for me, the thing I found was with trumpet, I would shake from nerves um, and singing for some reason, even right when I started doing it, just felt like the most natural expression of what I was trying to express. And even over, if I have to speak lines in a show, I, I like blush and I'm like, I can't sound like a normal human. I don't know how, how would a normal human say that, <laughs> but for some reason, anything I'm trying, any line, it feels more human to me to say like it feels more there's more meaning to it it feels more natural um and I think that this medium when it comes to like it's I struggled for a long time to call myself an artist because I don't create I don't write an opera right I didn't write any of the music I didn't write any of that but I I'm an interpreter of what someone else wrote and the thing that I've come back to my favorite part of it is just that I get to tell human stories Mm. And that's why this medium to me, even compared to like, I don't know, musical theater or straight theater or orchestral, you know, I loved playing in orchestras as a trumpet player. And there's something incredible about being one of many in an orchestra that I miss at times. But to bring together the like text, the language, the costumes, the dance, the staging, like, and that's why when people I'll, you'll hear people say they don't like opera. And my first question is usually, have you seen one? Usually they haven't. Um, but if you listen to opera on the radio, it's sort of like listening to a monologue from a scene from a movie without mm. any other context. And then saying, do you like movies? Mm. You know? And, and so it's like, I don't tend to sit and listen to opera that much because for me, it's about the whole medium mm. of it's the theater, it's the human story that's being told that the music is communicating. And which is one, and it all, also we don't, mic, we don't use microphones. And so the human voice in a space is different, which is why we'll get into the pandemic eventually, but why digital productions of opera have not, is not our medium. And it's the best we could do. And it's great that companies are doing it, but there's something incredible about sitting in the back of a hall and having a human voice project all the way back but anyway but yes yeah, so that's it just once I stepped into it I was like I have no idea why this is what I'm supposed to be doing but for some reason it just felt like the most natural way for me to communicate mm, mm -hmm. yeah I'm curious how you guys would describe um that something with a capital S that you guys are trying to communicate because I find that that art, that beauty seems to communicate that core something in a way that truth, for example, doesn't like, or truth, you know, might try to hit you 
square in the forehead through through the front door um, with its rational arguments and things. And I feel like beauty kind of gets in the back door in a way when you look at a painting or a sculpture or listen to an opera or experience the entire opera, the whole sensory experience that you know something in a way that someone couldn't have argued you there, like mm -hmm. with words. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you had to use words, how you might describe what it is that you're trying to convey. Mm -hmm. I, we can change the direction. Yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> I, I think that for me, we've been discussing this a lot over the past couple of days, because I think the, instead of maybe using the word truth, I would maybe use the word facts hmm. versus truth. Because for, for me, truth and beauty in opera, if my, if my voice is pristinely, perfectly projected through an entire evening, everything perfect, but there's no meaning behind it there's no you know risk taking there's no emotional like like the scream in the voice at the moment it's supposed to be there to me it's boring but like like perfection is sort of that and so I think I to there's something about art that people will engage with that they want and quick, quick example for me is I uh there's this musical called Ragtime that's about the turn of the century and it's the white community, African-American community, and immigrant community, all sort of represented in the story. It was written in the 60s, but it's about the turn of the century. And the whole point of the show is that nothing has changed, that there's still this conflict going on. And I discovered this in high school in a very non-diverse part of the country, and then recently saw it again after living in Chicago for seven years. And I was sitting there and the opening scene happened and all these groups of people walked on stage and I started sobbing because I realized things that I didn't, back when I first saw it, I didn't realize were still happening in the world. It still hasn't changed since the turn of the century in a lot of ways. And then I looked around at the audience and saw this very non-diverse, um, upper middle-class white middle-aged audience. And I was like, I bet a lot of these people wouldn't sit and listen to a, some, a lecture or a, polit a politician's speech or someone ta talk about the issues being dealt with in this, mm -hmm. in this musical. But when they watch a human story being told in front of them and they feel it and they get connected to it, they're going to go home and talk about it and think about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think human storytelling, and it's not always beautiful, but it, it gets to the truth in a way that allows people to think about it and allows their hearts to open up even when their brain wouldn't want to, if it was presented a different way, like you said. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think for me, that's the cool thing that the performing arts do is people don't even realize they're sort of not being preached at, but being challenged with a story that if they heard it in another context, especially because opera is very extreme. People do terrible things in opera. And if you heard about it in another way, you, you would respond a different way. But if you sit there for four hours falling in love with a character mm -hmm. and then watch the choice they make, it gives you a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next. I think you said the word that I would have put on mm -hmm. the capital S something was connected. Mm -hmm. And you said it in there. People all of a sudden are connected to you know, and I think it's like that capital S something, if I had to try to put a word on it, it's like this experience of connection. I don't know. It's like when you're in that place, even witnessing art, and I need to learn to like witness performing arts more. I haven't been very mm -hmm. exposed to it, but I'm like loving listening to you <laughs> talk right now. But yeah, that, that connection. And so like, for me, that, that capital S something that I'm like, it's just, it's that connectedness to well, the present moment and all of a sudden your world explodes and you're sort of connected to everything. I work with live models when, when I'm blessed to have the money now to do it, but it's how I was trained and it's the thing I love the most. And I mean, a connection between someone, I'm not speaking to them at all and I'm beholding them in all that they are, usually nude. And just the connectedness of that. And it's, it's beyond what some erotic experience could give me or some any kind of other human experience it's just this other 
kind of beholding connection, but then it's not even just connectedness to the here physical, my hands. It's like a, all of a sudden I'm connected to this thing that's outside of me mm. and I don't have to like know it. Like, and truth can't tell me it, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I love philosophy. I love those brains in the world who can argue for days about the existence of these truths. And I'm grateful for them, but nothing's convicted my heart more than like this capital S something connected, like all of a sudden heaven and earth are together. I mean, and and it really does feel that special. And it's not like a prolonged moment. It's like these drops, right? It's like a moment. And, but there've been enough times that that's happened that you just stay hungry for it and you keep going. Mm. And the low parts of our earth, many and vast but like (laughs) the drop of connection like those moments you know are just really like I think what keep all of the arts all the people willing to like give their life to their art you know Mm -hmm. going and trying to just have that connection again Mm. yeah beautiful thank you Kate how about you Kelly yeah I'm I'm in you know some version of the same idea but I think one thing that I would say a lot because I work in the I work with the church a lot and the Protestant, I work with all different kinds of churches, not just the Protestants, but I am a Protestant myself. And um, there seems to be this perception among Protestants, many Protestant churches that they're trying to like, they're trying to bring beauty back into the church, the aesthetic, especially, uh, especially the visual because music has, has always been there. Um, the word has been there, um, whether the, uh, not just the scripture, but the words are aesthetic too. You know, I think that that's, it's important to name that the word apple is also not an apple. Mm. Um, In the same way that the painting, a painting of an apple or photograph of an apple or sculpture of an Mm. apple is not an apple, it's not the thing. So I think we give a lot of weight to words and and logical arguments that are, it's good. It's just not complete. It's it's not the whole picture. And, um, you know, I'm always arguing that the unseen is as real as the visible world. And words make the unseen visible. I mean, I, it's Stephen King in his brilliant little memoir that he wrote on writing says that uh, writing is magic. It's literally magic. You're writing something and then it appears in someone else's brain. Mm. And I don't want to lump words like it. And maybe that's just me in my context of the church and people elevating the word so high, highly. And, and we should elevate the word, but it is to an abstraction. So oh, well said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I love, I mean, there's this undercurrent here of each what I would call the spirituality behind each of your professions and the art that you do, you know, whether it's the unseen or changing hearts through stories and the emotions carried through there, or Kate, I love how you said there's like this, um, being able to pursue and also invite people into that sense of connection and that those drops of whatever you call it, inspiration, connection, capital S something, Um, that you receive that is often what uh, motivates your art. And I find that's also the same thing that happens in the contemplative life for people spiritually. They have some sort of taste of the divine, of some sort of profound connection with with themselves, with God, reality, whatever they want to call it. And that's what spurs them on this spiritual adventure to (laughs) pursue um, this nameless something and uh, Kelly, when you were speaking earlier about uh, the landscape, you know, of the Midwest, we all grew up in various places in the Midwest. Um, in all small towns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in small towns. And I know for me personally, that was such a huge formative experience for me. Now living out in Oregon, you know, sometimes, even though it's so beautiful, like volcanoes and mountains and oceans and waterfalls, and but there's something so beautiful about the Midwest, about South Dakota, those big skies, that 360 degree horizon, the rolling hills, um, the colors, my gosh. <laughs> like, I mean, I just remember sitting, you know, in my childhood house in this, these big bay windows and seeing the Coteau Hills in the distance that looked purple in the sunset. And like, this is, this is all I want, <laughs> you know, just reflecting back to me that spaciousness that I, 
I'm always in pursuit of interiorly. And mm-hmm. with all of that, I'm, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on um, anything you'd like to share about how your spirituality intersects with the art that you do. What does that look like? I, again, feel like these are inseparable for me because my, my spirituality at this point in my life is just not, um, it's not separable from the rest of my life. I, one of my pastors said something, maybe this was eight or nine years ago now that I first heard this, but he said, I want you to experience Jesus in the shoe leather of your life. Uh, every step that you take, it's, he's there, um, embedded in all of you. And I just, at that time in my life, I knew nothing about what that felt like. And so I began to really pursue God. And I mean, at that time I was a full-time photographer and, um, that's when I started, uh, through my study of the word to, to really remember that God spoke to me in images it was always there. He was always speaking to me in images, even when I was singing. For context, I went to school with Laura. That's how we met. Um, so I also am a, a trained singer. And I thought that's what I was going to do. Um, but God always spoke to me visually. And, um, you know, I wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have called it God. I don't even think back then when I was in high school or when I was younger. But it's like I got all of this context. Um, the longing that I felt, you know, when I was surrounded by the Iowa landscape or it always happens in the autumn, man, it Mm -hmm. intensifies when you first walk outside and the air smells that certain way that it does. Um, or for me, music was the vehicle to the, to the unseen, unlike anything else. Um, it's like a visual stimulant, even though there's nothing visual there for me. And so in my spiritual life, I began to realize that scripture was just like so multi-layered, so complex that it brought up these images in me and I began to respond. And so my visual arts practice was just born out of like responding, trying to find a way to, um, the way that I like to always put it is that I think the experience of the aesthetic, um, it can be like a feast. So, and what I really try to do in my work is like truly create like a banquet table. Um, It's not just the paintings. Um, Not every work I do has writing, but sometimes there's writing along with it. There's the scripture, whatever inspired it. And it's, there's no feast where you can eat everything on the table, Mm -hmm. right? You can't, you just can't take it all in. Um, But I, that's the kind of experience I want to create. That's what faith and, and the spiritual life feels like to me. Um, it's communal. A feast also implies that. I think art, the experience of art is communal. And so for me, it's, it's not even something that I'm like, how can I, can I bring these two parts of my life together? It's just like, um, it's, it just is inseparable. I feel like there was a more eloquent way to say no. it. Oh, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, yeah. It. that's, that's how, um, that's how it is. And I could do it no other way. So, cool. yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I, you know, I think that for me, a lot of my, a lot of what I end up feeling that spirituality is linked with is not necessarily in the moment that I'm doing the job because it's, it's such, (laughs) I get so frustrated. (laughs) Like it's, it's one of those, it's one of those things where in the moment I've had very few experiences where I would say I experienced a spiritual moment in the middle of singing opera Hmm. because it's not I'm not the one who's there to feel it right Hmm. like it's it's I am doing it so you can feel it and so I would say this is an area so for me my faith is just my it's who I am it's lived out in my life and I would say in the way that I'm called to love people in my business um but I think when it comes to to this art form. I mean, there are, there are religious, um, faith symbols through a lot of opera. Um, and also these sort of big overarching concepts of forgiveness and redemption and sin and death and love and all of these that are explored of the human experience. And I think sort of like I was speaking to before, I think this is an art form where 
people can, even if they haven't walked through the horrible thing opera characters often walk through, you know, there is a similarity in, you know, I've felt rejected, right? I've, I've had loss in my life. Um, and so I think that when it comes to that, it's like, if I do my job well, I leave it out there and trust that sort of like the spirit is moving in how people are experiencing it. That's mm. sort of the great thing about music. And I had a similar, for me, for me, the, this concept of Zane Zooks, this longing that we've been talking about that we'll get, I think, get more into. I was first experienced it in like Mahler symphonies, which anyone mm. who knows classical music he just, it's like every instrument he could toss in there, he does to create the most bombastic moments and also the most like deliciously quiet and like simple melodies. And there's something about it that it, it, he, it's like he uses all the colors that mm. music can create. And that was one where I just remember sitting there and being overwhelmed by listening to that. And it, ha it happens in opera too, but I, but I think it's just something that music has, has the power to do. And even, even people who aren't artists or musicians, mm -hmm. but are just human beings who have, you know, stood outside in the fall and like stood there and took a deep breath, right? Or have been driving with the windows down or listening to their favorite song. They know that experience and don't necessarily recognize it as something linked to God. Mm -hmm but know that there's something about that that's beyond human mm. or logic, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. So yeah, my medium's a little different, but I sort of leave, leave your experience to you. <laughs> and yeah. I, uh, yeah, that's a nice, nice way of putting it. It made me think of almost like a, a pastor who, you know, I mean, they do this practically the same thing every Sunday and I imagine that the majority of them aren't having a profound spiritual experience every single yeah. Sunday. You know, it's like, nope, I'm here for you. Like, yeah. this, is, this is my role. Yeah. Yeah. For me, like, spirituality and art, I don't know. I think it's, well, one, my study of art history, like, it just propelled me into making, wanting to really make art for the Lord. Like, it mm -hmm. just because we were studying all the way back to the very first traces of art we have on this planet, you know, the cave paintings. And then you go through every culture, every religion, every faith, and all the way through every century, what's every culture creating for, for the divine. And it's mm -hmm. like, that was also really convicting of faith for me because I've always been a big struggler with faith and have tried to leave the church many a time and just, <laughs> It's actually that it's just been my study of art history and seeing like the conviction of every living person that we have documentation of in every culture. It's about God, whatever God, whatever divine, but they know it and they, they give everything for it. Their yeah. most precious jewels go into creating that little piece of work, their most precious pigments, you know, they would even like not eat all of the food so that they could have collect the pigments from that precious fruit to make that precious color to make mm -hmm. that precious mm -hmm. you know and I'm like whoa and I just want to be part of that legacy you mm -hmm. know and I think we create for the time and space that we're in and God is ever present and ever speaking to us and we're mm -hmm. uniquely made by a divine mm -hmm. lover and it's just like what could I do except for try to give back and try to put some sort of shape or some sort of offering on the table and just like join the legions of people who have tried. And like, I love that about art history. And I, I work in like representational art, you know, I'm like trying to make what I see in front of me and doing my best to like, well, still with some abstractions, you can't ever not abstract. You have to emphasize something by elongating it in a way that might be natural might not be natural or whatever but like I don't know it's just even whatever kind of art whether it be music whether it be an abstracted whether it be tribal art whether it be whatever it's like thank God for all of them because all of them try to try to paint the picture of what this God this actual creator we're just the craftsmen we're not creators because to be a creator you take nothing and make it something we're all working with something he gave us so much to work with you know and it's all the some things that he created and then let me just try to craft something else in return like this dialogue with you god 
And then the other, the other part of it too, for me, that's been really special in the last year, I just um, sculpted a monument of the Holy Family and it's the incarnation, you know, like I don't think that I'm called to solely make art that's like explicitly Christian. Like this is Mary, this is Jesus, this is Joseph, but I'm honored to do it when it comes my way. And that was such an honor for me to make the Holy Family and just to contemplate. I mean, in this depiction I did, Jesus was a little bit older. I'm currently sculpting a little nativity and the incarnation is just enough for me. Like I could contemplate that for a lifetime. The fact that this creator who took nothing and made something then made him came to be with us in all of this yeah. as a little baby. And then it was just for me also, like I feel Mary as a really important I don't know, model of what that could be. Like, what does an artist look like? Or what does being a craftsman or, you know, something look like it's Mary's womb. And so I just really feel like that as my kind of calling <laughs> sort of in this time and space of like, what does that look like to just do play my part in a yes to the Lord and let the, the one come in to my sculptures or whatever and reside there the way he resided in the womb of Mary you know and it's like I know that's maybe idol <laughs> worship or something to say oh this statue but no it represents but actually I also think the divine is in it and as far as we invite him into it mm -hmm. and I really try to invite him in like just I know I'm talking a lot but one quick story about my sculpture of Mary my sister's a single mom and I used like many models to make these sculptures and I have like seven different women who pose for the face of Mary because I really wanted like a multicultural mm -hmm. kind of representation of the family. But I needed a mom to pose for me and I, need, I needed it to be my sister. I was just like, I know she would know how to make the look on her face mm -hmm. that I need her to make so that she can communicate this moment between Mary and Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so she came to my studio, she got a weekend away from her son, I was blessing her. <laughs> And we spent time together and I just had her take the pose and I kind of explained the moment, like, this is what Mary, I think would be going through, but you just imagine Macklin, that's her son. I'm like, just imagine, and you do whatever. And within like 30 seconds, just tears are rolling out of her eyes. And these were long awaited tears, you know, this was like a real break. And I think this is what art and beauty and these kind of intangible moments, mm -hmm. right? Like, or seemingly, oh, it's just some clay. It's just a model, but I don't know, it's more. And when you've let the Lord come in and you've asked him to be there because you will. And so these tears are coming and I'm like, give your tears to Mary, Ali, she can hold them. And you know, that's the other beautiful thing about a three-dimensional form. She just wiped her tears and wipes them on the face. And I'm like, those tears are still there. Yeah, where the sculpture is now, it's in bronze. It's been, it's not on that material, but it's in it and the mm -hmm. Lord holds it. And if I tell the story, People know that, you know, I don't know. It's just like, I do think that the Lord longs to reside in anything that we want him to reside in, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's kind of the joy of being an artist, especially a spiritual artist, you know, that we get a little more like firepower to work with when we're trying to create because we're drawing from the source. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I have tears in my eyes, know, like <laughs> listening to her talk about this and yeah that was wow. like so beautiful yeah it's yeah. a gift from the lord yeah wow. yeah one thing that struck me from your story kate is how much goes into the process of creating okay. a piece of art like any of us i'm sure could try like look i can take this piece of clay and make it look like a person or an apple or a, you know something but that's that's not quite the same thing as creating a piece of art you know where it's just like look, it looks like something else that it actually exists in the world. And I'd be curious um, how you would describe what goes into your process of creating art, because it sounds like for each of you, I mean, it's this whole production, whether it's, you know, all the practice in opera or, you know, Kelly, you were saying like, sometimes it's meditating on scriptures or Kate it might be the incarnation or being with a model and, I feel like that's part of what makes art so valuable. And I'd love to hear what value you bring to your art and what value do you find in your art and in that whole process? First. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I can go first. So I, so for, when it comes to the process, it, it looks very boring, right? Like it's, it's getting a new, a fresh offer score, um, and highlighting my part and then translating it from whatever language it's in and just starting like sort of the painstaking process of, of sitting at the piano every day, um, and learning it. And I, and listening, listening to a lot of great recordings of great singers of the past. And, and so I think that a lot of often in, I think that when it comes to like you you were sort of saying, when it comes to art and performance, people assume that what they're paying for is what they see or like the, so for me, if I come do an opera or if I do a recital, they think they're paying for the hour and a half that I'm there singing the recital. When what it is, is I have to show up every day from or every job with my an entire, you know, two and a half to five and a half hour opera, learned, memorized, translated, and ready to go that first day. Like basically I could have performed it. And it's another cool thing is you never stop learning because I'll, every new role forces me to discover something new about my voice that I didn't know I could do, or that was there. Um, and you know, I remember the first time I sang a song that had a high, high C sharp or high D in it, high D. And I was like, I don't think I have a high, I, I let's find out. I guess I got to try it and discovered I had this note that just I hadn't needed before so I hadn't tried it and so there's just ever expanding ever learning and the instrument changes over your lifetime with hormone and age and you know I it won't fully be in its maturity until probably my mid-40s and I'll start a slow decline but like it it's it's a living thing itself that I sort of have to practice constantly to keep up with um but it's it's yeah, I don't know. It's a, I love it. I love all the, those stages of it. Um, and getting to culminate in the moment of freedom is pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, beautiful. You're so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Jules, it Jules. is so fun to hear about all these different, like, yeah, I don't know. I can't imagine doing anything else that you guys do, wow. <laughs> but this is really cool. Thanks for mm-hmm. having us do this. Mm-hmm. this yeah, so- absolutely. This is great. <laughs> Um, Laura, I have a side question. Um, what's been your favorite opera that you've performed? Oh, that's a, that's a longer question than you might want to ask. I'm not going to tell you why, because that'll take too much time, but my favorite opera, and I always say it's my dream role that I've gotten to do. And it's still my dream role. Like I can't wait to do it again. It's, it's a Czech opera by Leo Shiana Czech, uh, called Yanufa, um, which it's basically the re- the reason I'm going to give you a short version. The reason I love it is because it's a brilliantly told human story, very depre- dark and depressing, horrific things happen to this woman and the people in it. But the, the way the composer and the librettist, the librettist are the words that are attached to the opera, um, wrote it. Every character is complex and has a unique complex relationship to everyone else on stage. You see these journeys of people. And in the end, after going through horrific things, there's this moment of, it's not, because sometimes operas wrap it up in a nice little bow or they like throw themselves off a bridge and the opera's done. And, but this one, I know it's terrible, but this one, it's two broken people at the end. The opera, like they take someone off off stage, this mob of people, there's a silence. And then this, the most stunning ethereal music starts. And there's this duet that happens between two of these characters who've just gone through this together. And they just are two broken people deciding to walk forward. Mm-hmm. And like, there's this incredible redemption that's not superficial and it's not complete yet, mm-hmm. but it's this human experience of when you've gone through something and you're broken and you still have to decide to walk forward. It represents that in the most stunning and the music is just lush and beautiful and it's just not done a whole lot because it's in Czech Mm -hmm. as though people understand the Italian when they go to it (laughs) but but there are certain operas that people hear a tune they know and they'll go to it but this one needs to be that it needs to be done more Mm -hmm. because everyone who sees it it you can't you leave you can't leave unchanged Mm -hmm. by it um so that's my 
Wow. Yeah. That sounds really powerful. And I've gotten to do it twice so far and can't wait to do it. <laughs> wow. My this up. <laughs> um, wow. Well, wow. next, <laughs> how about, um, Kate, would you mind sharing with us? We were talking about process and everything that goes into the creation of your art and what you do. Would you share a little of that with us? So the process is, is really hard for me, actually, not the actual like models in the room, I'm making, I love the clay. I love sculpting. I love making the thing. It's the whole aftermath of actually getting the sculpture to a place where it, where it can exist in the world in a sustained way. Like it's not going to be deteriorated or broken or whatever is very difficult and something that I'm, I'm honestly still just trying to work out. Like I've learned how to sculpt. Well, now I have to learn this whole other thing, which is being more just like an artisan, like I need to know how to make better molds. I need to know how to cast those things. And all of that takes an insane amount of money, resourcing time. So, you know, I just like, it takes a lot of hands actually to bring yeah. a sculpture all the way mm -hmm. to life, especially if you're in bronze, there's nine different sections of a foundry that your piece will travel through. So that's like nine different teams of people on your sculpture to bring it through and that's just the bronze. Well then before that you have your mold maker and before that you have me doing the thing in clay. But then you also have your models that are participating in it. You have, it's a big old ordeal, you know? And it's, so it's really interesting like how little people understand that side. I loved what you were saying about the singing too, how much people don't understand how much is going into this stuff. And this isn't even talking about all our time just spent in personal formation as, human beings and like students will always be students. We're never gonna have it, you know? And that's the beauty of it, right? It's like, there's always some, some other level to chase or some other thing to contemplate or a, a new technique to try or something like that, but you have to study it. What strikes me in what you're sharing there is not just the technical part of here's what I need to do and you know all the steps and the foundry and um, the years of training and formation and your practice when, whether you're singing or painting or sculpting, but the emotional investment and, and even spiritual personal investment in that, because you're connecting with this character and its story, or you're contemplating the incarnation and trying to portray something of what you've seen and experienced for people in a way, not using words. Like, how do you even do that? How do you transmit that experience from your interiority to someone else's. That, yeah. that really is magic. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And actually just in response to that, that's the other whole part of it. It's nothing's linear, right? But especially in art, your process isn't a linear process. Yeah. It's not like, okay, for this project, A plus B plus C will equal D. It's like, okay, I'm gonna do my best. I know that I need to generally do these things, but I also have to show up every day. Mm -hmm. And am I having a good day? Is inspiration, hitting or am I having like the worst week or stretches of weeks and it just doesn't seem like I can make the right mark and you know actually so much of the process at least for me is not doing something right mm -hmm. it's sitting in the same room as the sculpture and looking at it and looking at it and just like willing it to be different or like trying you know and then maybe I go at it for a little while and I mess it up so bad that any progression I had made I'm actually just all the way back at the beginning mm -hmm. and I've destroyed entire works that have almost been there. Mm -hmm. And just like for integrity's sake, I actually have to start over, you know, and it's just that, like, it's not the same as clocking into the office and knowing that you have this job to do. And mm -hmm. okay, maybe there's some hiccup days, right? Like where, oh, that didn't go as well as I thought it would. Or, I was feeling under the weather. Sure. Like that's inevitable for everyone, but in art, it's just this whole other thing because it's, it's so outside of you. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it sounds almost more like spiritual practice where it's like, my job is to show up. And I don't know yeah. if like what God is going to do, if like inspiration will come, if I'm going to have a great meditation or if it's like every day, I feel like I'm banging my head against a wall. Like, okay, just let the thoughts go. Just let the thoughts yeah. go. Just let the thoughts yeah. go. You know? And then after <laughs> like weeks, you're like, oh my God, I have this like amazing, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> beautiful experience. But sometimes it stretches on seemingly yeah. forever. And yeah. uh, so much of that is 
most of that is out of your control. It's like you, you bring what you can, you bring your skill and what you've practiced, but <laughs> inspiration comes from somewhere beyond. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes That's you have fun. a cold. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, right like for you though <laughs> that, that you're like Shh, and the audience has no idea but you gotta go push like through do it anyway yeah yeah mm -hmm. kelly will you tell us a little bit about your process yeah i want to like cool say rest. while i'm thinking of it like i work in a building with other people and my studio door is like a patio door right mm -hmm. like i don't know it's you don't see those doors in the uh, interior yeah. very often it's like a sliding door so sometimes i feel like i'm in a fishbowl like wow. people see me working but I swear sometimes people think I just sit and stare all day. Like, <laughs> it's like, well, this pain, will you just tell me what is the next thing that I do? Cause I don't know. Like, yeah, like yeah. How, yeah, it's a lot of staring. So a lot of I just went into, to, to name that moment of resonance. Oh, I'm yeah. not the yeah. only one who stares. Um, yeah. So my process is again, which is what I'm most passionate about. What I, what gets me out of bed in the morning, what makes me stay up all night. It makes me so happy. It frustrates me all the emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's a big project, which is, I've been doing it since I started, but it's like a body of work for me. A body of work is like a very extended, like thought in, um, a meditation on one thing. And the body of work must have all of the paintings in it for it to be complete. You remove one and suddenly, for me, it's not the whole thing. It's like taking the um, recapitulation out of a symphony. And then the, like, to me, it's this unfolding. And so um, I've done that a lot in my career since I started, created a, a specific body of work. And that process usually takes um, anywhere from a year and a half to two years so far. Um, it could get longer. I don't know. As my career goes on, it seems to be doing that. But what I do is get an idea um, of something I want to express. I'll just give a tangible example um, of a show that I have on right now in Kansas City. And I, I decided I wanted to illuminate the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, very philosophical book, not linear in the slightest. You can't pick up Ecclesiastes and be like, yep, clearly we have a section here, we have a section here. But yet somehow I wanted to convey some of the truth and some of the ideas in a visual way to people. Um, so I start with the idea. And then from there, you know, obviously there's one part of the process is engaging as much as possible with the book itself, with the text. And then, um, I mean, this is an ancient text written in a language I don't speak in a culture that I'm extraordinarily removed from. And so um, it takes a lot of research, uh, learning about it, listening to lectures. Um, and so that, that was like, that is where the ideas come from, is all that head stuff, studying the word, praying, um, some visual things start to come in. Um, or I'm just begging God, give me some idea how to like convey these things that are impossible totally impossible to convey. Um, and then I enter a process of creating study work. Usually I, I have a bound sketchbook, but then that becomes too confining and I just have paper everywhere. And I'm trying to figure out like, literally like, what if I, you know, if I put this very thick, dark gray brush stroke down, how can I obliterate that? because my human life feels as tangible and immovable as this brushstroke, but it really isn't. Like it's things like that. How do I make a mark have meaning or how do I make the surface material have meaning? And then another question that, and this is a part of the process I, I want to like talk about. Um, I get asked like uh, when I'm standing in a room with my paintings, you know, like which one, uh, which one would you like to do again? Or is there one that you didn't feel like you, you know, you really nailed it. It's funny when pe the kinds of questions you get asked. And I always say like, oh, I, I didn't even scratch the surface on any of them. I don't know what you're talking about. Like I could go paint all of these again and it would be totally different. So for me, that's been really freeing, like embracing the idea that I could never capture the thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like just not possible. So I just ask God, give me a little sliver just like a peel back the veil of that Zane Zouch, give me a little bit of the, the thing, a taste of it so that I can and reflect a little bit of it onto the canvas. And so um, for me, the process is the reward. 
Mm. You know, I wanted to engage with Ecclesiastes because I knew contemplating this terrifying thing, which is the fact that I'm going to die. I mean, to me, that is a really hard thing to grapple with. And, and we lose people. I mean, I just can't, I, I came from a funeral today of someone who's very important to me. And um, I do the, the work with those heavy, difficult questions because I know I need, I need answers to them or I, not even answers. You can't even find the answers to those questions, but I need to grapple with them. I need to, I mean, that's what spirituality does is it gives us some tools to be able to like face those things in our life and for me that process um equips me in a way that um I don't think I could be equipped otherwise and it's sure the painting's great it's really fun to get to create an artifact out of that experience but the artifact is means way less Hmm. than the presence you know through that that whole process so yeah. yeah beautiful So we have time for one more question. And I thought maybe the most um, helpful way to wrap this all up is that um, motif that showed up a couple of times in our conversation is that of longing of this Zane suit. And I'm curious around um, how you experience longing, um, how the longing shows up in your art form or maybe in your process um, or even what you would say, like, what is the point of that longing? Where does it come from and where is it drawing us? I think it's, so this, I don't know if we ever define this concept of the key piece. Please do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Zingzucht, which is a German word. um, And actually Kelly will probably give a better definition than me. But it's something that I, when I, when I like discovered this word, it's something that's used in like the writings of C.S. Lewis, um, uh, religious writings, and then a lot in opera and classical music, especially in the Romantic period. Um, and it's this concept of this like bittersweet, like I the way I describe it to people who aren't, sort of aren't in this world, it's like that moment of sheer bliss that you get when you're driving with the windows down or you hear music and it just, you get overwhelmed by bliss for two seconds and it hurts because you know it's going to go away and you can't hold on to it but you, and you try to, but you also, when it's done, feel so overwhelmed that you got to experience it. Like, that's how I sort of describe this. And I think, I think that the, what is intrinsic in sort of the human voice as an instrument and, and like music in general is, is the grasping, well, in art is the grasping for that, Mm -hmm. to try to like, hold it, hold it long enough Mm. to see it and be able to really you know, like experience it. And I think that like all of our mediums, that's sort of what we're, that's, Mm -hmm. that's what we're going for. And you can't, you can't reason yourself. We don't know what it is, right? Logic doesn't get you there. But in my experience, like that is, that is the deepest connection I have had with God throughout my life is these Mm. moments, these moments where I'm like, that is not a human. C.S. Lewis says, you know, I, that, that if we have the satiation for all of these desi- these like hunger, we have food, thirsty of water. We all know what this is, but if it's not satiatable on earth, it must be from somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And so it's this idea that eventually we will, that is the divine that we will be connected with someday. Mm. And, and I think that that's, that's the like goal is to get, get people to, and they can't even verbalize it. I've had a couple experiences in my performance career where I had the, this man who's very shy and his partner came up and said he wanted to meet me. And he just sat there, held my hands and cried and like, couldn't, couldn't really verbalize what it was, you know, about just my perform, right? Like my performance or a moment of the opera, but that there's something that's that's and for me actually as I was thinking about the only time that I really experienced that transcendent moment is is I used to hate bowing I used to hate bowing and I don't like like applause is not the thing I get made fun of in my business because my bows are not long enough but I am like they're sufficient amount I won't go <laughs> but I think that there's there's I've had moments where I've done this opera I got to do the Yenufa in Santa Fe 
um, with the Santa Fe Opera, which is a stunning theater that's open to the elements. They tend to plan the stages around watching the sunset mm. um, in the background. And it was where I had been a young artist where I decided to switch voice types from mezzo-soprano to soprano. So it has a lot of meaning to me. And then I got rehired to come back and do this role I'm in love with at my favorite place. Mm. And on opening night, the way the final scene that I described earlier was staged, like the the, the two characters basically collapsed into each other at this moment of a blackout at, with like the orchestra and the audience erupted in a way that I was like, it felt like we were at this rock concert. It, it was, it was crazy. And I ended up just in tears for the vows because that's, that's when you realize you did, you, you gave them something and they got it. You know, that's sort of the, like, you don't, you don't want to sort of leave it's hard to want someone to get something from what you're giving them because you have to allow them that freedom. But it's always something special when what you were really striving to show them about this character or their journey, when you see that they got it or that it touched them or that it reminded them of something. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's, it's why we need the arts mm -hmm. and it's why we need all of the art forms because opera is not going to touch everyone's heart mm -hmm. in the same way that sculpture will or or paintings will it's at, you know and it shows how individualistic we all are Lewis talks about the idea of a key and a lock that someday we'll discover it's like being a key having a key and never seeing a lock you know not understanding what this goes to and at some point we're going to be fit perfectly in and be completely and utterly known and understood and seen and I think that like this speaks to the human individuality and the deep love that we have from our creator and how we were in it together to experience these different things. Mm. And I think that that's what continues to remind us. It's like nature too, that reminds us that there's, there's something beyond our strivings. Mm. Mm -hmm. I guess. Beautiful, I yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. The question is how long and what? <laughs> yeah. I'm just like really lost. <laughs> I know. I was listening to anything else to say. That was what so else good. is there to say? <laughs> yeah. How you experience longing and if you would like to comment on why it's there in the first place and where it's drawing us. I can jump in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I I think your definition of saying search was perfect. I always call it homesickness because mm -hmm. it feels like I've been there before, but I haven't. Um, it, it's, it's a no, it's a feeling known or, um, I've, I've experienced things with people like in a, in a conversation, have you ever had one of those conversations yes. yeah. where you're just like, can I, you want to hold it, you want to freeze frame it or something so that you can prolong it for eternity, that feeling of being known or the experience of beauty. And it comes in nature. I remember a really intense experience of Zane Zucht I had when I was a teenager was the first time I heard the orchestral work by Vaughn Williams, mm. Fantasia on a Theme by Thomas Tallis. Um, so it's just, it's like a, a long riff of just stringed instruments on what turns out to be just a little hymn, a little church hymn written by Thomas Tallis. And it's so dark and bright and like expansive I listened to it with headphones on and I remember feeling physically just like arrested by this music, like held, like elevated and held in the air, like suspended. Mm. Um, I had such a physical reaction. I think I also described this recently. I was writing about Zayn Zouk and I said it was like being struck by lightning. Every part of me was like alive and I wanted to prolong it. And I thought it was in the music. I thought, I always thought it was just, you know, the beauty itself was the source of the longing. And when I met Laura and she introduced me, I, I knew the word Zane Zucht from like, you know, how many romantic poems are titled Zane Zucht? Zucht. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'd heard it before, but I'd never heard it equated with God. And truly this concept that that longing points to God who can complete it in its fullness, not here on earth though, later, was instrumental in my faith journey and convincing mm -hmm. me that like God was real and present in my body, that, that it was him that was in all of that, that was living through that music. 
And, um, man, that was powerful for me. And I just think that, um, when it comes to that experience of longing, I will forever be, cause it's so real. And I think it's universal. Most people I talk to have some mm-hmm. understanding of it. I think that, um, yeah, it, I, in reading and studying Ecclesiastes so much recently, there's this little verse in chapter three, after the really famous poem about the seasons of life, there's a time for this and a time for this. Everybody knows this one pretty much. It's very familiar, but right after that, um, the author slips in this little line where he says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. And he has put eternity into the heart of man yet so that he cannot find it out from the beginning to the end. And to me, that is like, that has become like, oh, I'm like, oh, now I have Bible verse for saints. So you're like, see, it's, right there. it's eternity in the heart, but we cannot consummate that longing on earth. And that is a, it's so painful in a sense. It's really painful that the thing it's, that's why we call it bittersweet. It, it can't be grasped. The, the work isn't complete. We, I know my paintings are going to decay and, and, I mean, they're not going to last forever and ever. Um, Even the beauty of of a human being with a a living immortal soul in in them, that it doesn't last is so painful, but like that, that that beauty can't be consummated here and now is a gift because it, it, it should force us to look beyond ourselves or beyond the thing, whether tangible or intangible for the source of ultimate beauty and ultimate fulfillment of that longing. And that's, I mean, that'll get me out of bed in the morning. <laughs> so, yeah. Beautiful. I can't really add anything to it. Honestly, for me, it's really difficult to put that into mm-hmm. words. I can talk about a lot of the other things about art, but the reason I'm doing art is just that. It's just, mm-hmm. I can't put it into, I'm not verbal about it. I yeah. Can't, thank you God for giving me something to respond mm-hmm. with, you know, like my hands and just trying, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I understand, and this isn't like false humility or something like it's, I just understand that what I'm trying to speak to it, it's like a little tiny scratch at it, but the Lord loves that little scratch. And he just, I think he just delights in it. Mm-hmm. Every time we get one of those little moments of I've always just thought it was nostalgia and I, I love moments of nostalgia or something. I'm like, or deja vu is what I mm-hmm. used to think it was. And yeah, as I've gotten older and then especially just like, you, I can learn it again and again when I hear them talk, I'm like, whoa. And I just had a rush of like memories and a mm-hmm. rush of experiences come back. And it's like, that is so precious. And the Lord just loves it. He loves mm-hmm. to give them. Mm-hmm. And I do think that that other Bible verse is so accurate that like, if we would see God, we would we would die like it would be too much and it's true it's like the getting struck by lightning like Mm -hmm. like knowing it's about to leave but oh like this this deep pain like something bigger but not Mm -hmm. us and it's like yeah okay good that it's only for that moment and good that it's sprinkled through a lifetime you know so and and they're so beautiful that they give it's enough just that two seconds Mm -hmm. I can can I can contemplate it and remember it for the next year through dry seasons and I'm currently in a dry season and I'm just like whoa I'm beyond grateful for this moment to just sit here and remember and Mm -hmm. like here we'll try to put words and remember that my part is to just maybe I can't put words but I can try to make something and maybe that's my thing that will help strike it in someone else to just recall and remember like God is love and God is real and he is delighting you in this moment and he's delighted for you to know him and he can't wait to show you more it's not yet but look have a peek you know and it's that's so beautiful I'm just like I'm so emotional by this conversation and so grateful mm-hmm. to you to making it happen and like bringing these two into my life and yeah I just feel really profoundly grateful and I do think that maybe that longing you know I don't know without gratitude how can you really hold it so thanks for getting me back to a place of gratitude for it. It's so special. Yeah, absolutely. It is such a um, deeply human theme and listening to the three of you speak of that, of that longing. I mean, we could be listening to 
you know, any of the classic mystics speaking of it, you know, speaking of longing as the beginning of prayer or as prayer itself, like that that's mm -hmm. divinely inspired um, and something that's meant to lead us closer to that divine reality. And it's beautiful that each of you experience that not only in your spirituality, but in your art and use that art to respond and try to um, share that invitation with others in the world. It's a beautiful gift. Yeah. Well, I thank you all for joining us. Um, again, this is Laura Wildey, the soprano, and Kate Marin, the sculptor, and Kelly Cruz, the painter. And I am so thankful for all of this beautiful conversation, very rich. So thank you for, for making it happen. Making it happen. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you all. Oh, and lastly, if anyone wants to find out about you and your work, where should they go? Why don't we start with you, Laura? Um, yeah, I have a website, laurawildysoprano.com or laurawildysoprano on Instagram and probably Facebook. Um, not great at all of that, but yeah, I have schedules and, and things like that. Oh. Beautiful. Thank you. How about you, Kate? I'm also not good at all that. <laughs> I have an Instagram that I haven't posted on really at all, but Kate Marin Art, so it's the same, katemarinart.com or Kate Marin Art on Instagram. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. I'll just give you my Instagram because you can get to my website and everything from there. Um, but it's just Kelly Cruz Creative um, at Kelly Cruz Creative. And for obvious reasons, creative is spelled with a C the way it's, <laughs> I get that question a lot. Um, I say for obvious reasons because just think I don't need three Ks. Yeah. And they, <laughs> and they ask, like, why don't you do that? But so at Kelly Cruz Creative, and I, I share a lot of behind the scenes of my studio there. Um, so that's the best place to go. Awesome. Thank you. This has been a joy. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much, Kelly. Yeah, absolutely.